I'm Howard Wall. Welcome to Free Exchange, hosted by the Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise at Lindenwood University. The Hammond Institute fosters free enterprise and civil and religious liberty through the examination of market-oriented approaches to economic and social issues. And uh, I'm the director of the Hammond Institute, and we're joined today by the director of the uh, Liberty and Ethics Center, Rachel Duchamp. Hello, Hi. Rachel. How are you doing? Good. And you? Well. Well, I have my first question to you, and I'm sure anyone who's taken classes with you, is you are an associate professor of philosophy. That's right. But it seems like you've now turned to the dark side because <laughs> you've not only you're not only are you in the uh, free enterprise institute for free enterprise, but you've also moved to the business school. Can you yeah, the school, tell us the how school of business and entrepreneurship? Yes. Right. Can you tell us how all of that fits into? What's going on? Well, it's been a long time in coming. I think I um, I started out uh, in college, interested in libertarian philosophy and classical liberalism, which is um, probably the political philosophy most easily associated with our founders, with the with the American founders, and. Uh, that developed over time. I ended up writing a, a dissertation on David Hume's classical liberalism, and Hume is actually a very important person in the history of economics, um, understanding the um, quantity theory of money, and also in political philosophy. And so um, over time, I've just always had those overlapping interests. Um, one of the people that Hume inspired most was F.A. Hayek, the great economist. And the reason uh, he was so inspired by him is because Hume really understood how human beings coordinate with one another, and sometimes in an unspoken way. And uh, these organic institutions can arise spontaneously. They evolve spontaneously. And those are really the uh, things that create the infrastructure of a, of a well-functioning society. So as a political philosopher, I'm interested in a well-functioning society, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, knowing Hume, knowing Hayek, um, I became more and more interested in the overlap of economics and philosophy. And, uh, and so finally, uh, working for the Institute on the idea of free markets and, of course, being around business people themselves, which has been delightful. The, the School of Business and Entrepreneurship has welcomed me with open arms, <laughs> and uh, I'm really enjoying being there, yes, not the, least because of our beautiful building. The, the evil comes out later. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, also, the Liberty and Ethics Center is a new entity. That's uh, right. It was kind of existed in the shadows the last few months as we were getting the uh, Hammond Institute uh, off the ground. Uh, but it really is uh, a collection of things you've been doing, some of it you've been doing all along. Uh, can you tell us about some of the things that, uh, that the Hammond Inst or the Liberty and Ethics Center is about and how yeah. it, it came together? Yeah, once again, it's also been a long time coming because uh, when I first came here, one wonderful thing about Lindenwood University is they actually uh, encourage a sort of entrepreneurship among the faculty. If you have a good idea, they'll really let you run with it. And I remember our provost, who was my dean at the time, Jan Weitzel, saw that I had an idea for our conference, and she said, what is this? Tell me about this. You should do this, you know, and was very encouraging. Um, one of my mentors, who is now a fellow for the Liberty and Ethics Center, is named Don Livingston, and he's someone who's really interested in federalism, uh, true federalism, right, of having uh, a number of entities that are that are uh, competing with one another under uh, uh, an overarching government. And he wrote a book that inspired my dissertation. And so I wanted to do a conference with him, bring him in and some of the other scholars that, that I've learned so much from over the years and discuss these notions of a true federalist government to, with my students and true what we would call republicanism. And by that, I don't mean the Republican Party, it's capital R, but little r, republicanism, self-government. Right, mm -hmm. true self-government, and uh, some some questions that we don't ask anymore. You know, what's the proper size of a of an entity that can govern itself? Is America too big to have true self-government? You know, nobody talks about those sorts of questions anymore. So, uh, and yet I think they're quite quite pressing. And so it, we started out with that. Uh, we talked about the American decentralist tradition. Uh, we talked about. Um, uh, Missouri, the state of Missouri in particular, and its history, which is which is quite storied in that regard. Uh, we've done other things on free markets and ideology, free markets and localism. So about six conferences, uh, annual conferences that have occurred uh, over the last several years, and um, I think uh, that's how the Liberty and Ethics Center sort of came about. Now, as we've focused on the mission of the Liberty and Ethics Center in particular, 
uh, in furthering the mission of the Hammond Institute, what I really saw was a kind of tripartite division, okay? We think of the state, the role of the state, and especially uh, for libertarians, you know, in, in generating kind of the basic infrastructure of law. And then you have markets, which can be so powerful in allowing people to, to move forward and uh, especially uh, to bringing up their, their level of life. And then the third entity, which often gets forgotten, which is civil society. Um, all of the voluntary organizations, they're not necessarily totally separate from the market or from the state. They may have involvements with both. They may, they may draw on both. But we think of you know, church organizations, clubs, all sorts of voluntary associations, professional organizations, et cetera, all of which are just people with their sort of plucky spirit getting together to accomplish something. And um, um, I've been very influenced by Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote Democracy in America, and as he was touring America, he just noticed that that's what Americans do, and it really struck him because he was French. And he said, you know, in France, you'd go to the state to do this, or in England, there'd be a great lord in charge of this, but in America, they just make a club. And now, so I Now, went, do you think de Tocqueville is still, if de Tocqueville came to America today, what do you think he would see? Do you think he would oh, write a, a different book? You know, uh, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, although things have changed, America is actually still extremely strong in this regard. And a great example of this is Arthur Brooks' book, uh, Who Really Cares? In that book, he goes over all the data for charitable giving, including time, uh, including volunteering. And he sees that Americans just far outstrip most other people on the planet for, for getting together and donating time and money to private efforts to solve social problems. So we're still way ahead. I think it's still in our bones, okay? So we may not talk about it in the same ways, but it's still in our bones. And, um, and sometimes it's downright shocking. I mean, the French level of charitable giving is, uh, I think, behind Tunisia. So, <laughs> you know, when you look at the numbers on these things, they can be really shocking. Um, so I think Americans are still like this. We still are, you know, we do a drive every Christmas or we do, you know, our, our um, you know, serving breakfast at the shelter through church or whatever. And, and that's just a regular part of American life. We've even seen it in the political discussions about being of service in your community. Well, there also seems to be a, on the other side of it, is a, a change, though, in the recipient attitude, the recipient of charity. Uh, sometimes right. uh, it's, well, even government programs are now called entitlements. Ah, uh, yes. And I remember watching something when I was in England on the BBC. It was someone who, uh, this was actually about New Zealand, but the story was that uh, government uh, food uh, assistance was, was re greatly reduced. And this woman was complaining that uh, I didn't, you know, I can no longer go to the government to get uh, my, my food paid for. I have to go to charities. Right. And she still had the same amount of food, but somehow uh, receiving it from charities was uh, right. was not part of her entitlement or, or what have you. Yeah, I had a European professor uh, in graduate school that, that would talk about America as a charity society, and that was not a, a compliment <laughs> uh, because she wanted it something to be a right. Um, and she didn't want us to have that, you know, a person to have to have that sense of gratitude or whatever we might associate with charity. But there was a great book by Marvin Olasky called The Tragedy of American Compassion. And in this book, he describes the way we used to do charity. And the advantage that he points out wasn't so much that you had to be grateful or something like that, but rather that it was face to face. And therefore, people could tailor the help that they gave to the needs of the, of the individual. And so, um, you know, if they knew that a certain sort of way of distributing charity would increase the dignity of the individual, they would do it that way. Mm -hmm. And he tells stories of, you know, men would chop a certain amount of wood, they would take the wood to a poor widow, and then they'd come back and get their meal. Well, what a different way of distributing a, a, a good to someone in a way in which they can feel that they've not only done good work, but they've done good work for other poor people or for sure. someone who's maybe even worse sure. off. And, and the tragedy for him is that we have begun in our private charity to imitate the way we do public charity, which is this sort of faceless, soup kitchen style, don't ask any questions, don't get to know anybody too much. And that is too bad if that's the case, because what it means is that we've lost that personal element that allows people's deep-seated needs to be addressed, the things that are really the root causes of the situation they're in, as opposed to just, uh, just the mere facts. Right. No, and actually I see it with even the private 
private charities, now you even have collective charities like, say, the United Way, mm. where it's you give the money to them and then they decide where it goes. Mm. So you can't even lose the connection uh, between the donor and of who's the being helped service. and then and so on. So it's right. And with uh, my own students, I do emphasize. Um, and I'm sure many of those efforts are great efforts, but I do emphasize for them to have some sort of on the ground experience with their community service. Let's go and do it ourselves. Let's go to Joplin and plant trees, or let's go down to the city and work with the women's shelter. Um, because that's important for them to actually spend time, spend a day and be with someone experiencing what's going on in their lives, as opposed to just sort of, oh, I'll just, you know, hand out my funds. And in a way, the European situation is the, the extreme version of that, right? We'll just give everything we've got to the state, the state will distribute it all, and I won't even have to pay any attention. Right. Yeah. Now, you mentioned uh, the involvement of, of students, and you're interacting a lot with students, and mm -hmm. this is actually a, a part of the Liberty and Ethics Center in particular, of the Hammond Institute parts, uh, deals much more directly with students. Yeah, that's uh, right. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, actually, back in 2008, um, when Ron Paul was running for president, there was a, a huge groundswell of interest in him, I think largely just because he was so different. Yeah. You know, and I remember the students coming to me and saying, who is this guy? He doesn't talk like the other politicians. He doesn't seem to be trying to please anyone. And, and because of that groundswell of interest, we started a group called Students for Liberty, and they actually started a student newspaper, and it was wonderful. It was a kind of hilarious newspaper, lots of great send-ups. Um, it, it kind of frittered away mostly because of just how much effort it took to do that. And so what I'm hoping to do with the Liberty and Ethics Center is regenerate that group, you know, and, and begin again the Students for Liberty, um, if they would like to do a newspaper, possibly do that. And then also um, to be sort of funneling students who are interested in these sorts of ideas into the correct um, summer programs, summer internships, you know, educational programs that would be available to them. And so to be kind of like a hub, you know, sort of networking hub for those students, because I think that there's students that are definitely interested in free market ideas uh, and in uh, conservative and libertarian politics, but they don't necessarily know how to move forward with that or how to get involved with that. And I'm, I'm connected to, you know, the Acton Institute, the Cato Institute, the Koch Foundation, the Liberty Fund, you know, a lot of different organizations. Well, and I think as we were, we've been putting together all of these activities and talking about it for uh, months now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think what we do fits better into the Lindenwood mission, which is to be student-centered. Right. And a lot of universities pay lip service to being student-centered. Right. But Lindenwood really actually is, research, and so, yeah. so in, are we. And the, a lot of these centers, I don't want people to get the wrong idea that we're not student-centered. We're not like other institutes in many ways. But in particular, uh, students are one of our main uh, focuses that, in, in what we do. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. So, so the student group is important to me, but also using you know, GAs and work and learns that will have chances to meet these speakers that we bring in, to network, to get to know these organizations and also pulling in the community. That's a very important goal of mine. I think especially in St. Charles, we have tons of interested people who would enjoy um, the sorts of uh, programs we have to offer and uh, connecting students with community members and vice versa. When we come back, we'll talk about those, those programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks, we'll take a break and we'll come back in a moment. Welcome back to Free Exchange and we're continuing our talk with uh, Rachel Duchant, who is the director of Lindenwood University's Liberty and Ethics Center. Uh, so, Rachel, there, uh, we're just, you're just starting with the Liberty and Ethics Center and getting things off the ground, but you already have uh, several things uh, planned that are concrete and other things that you're wanting to do, kind of goals. Can you tell us a little bit about what's, uh, what's uh, in your plans for the year? Yeah, well, of course, as I mentioned, the student group is a huge uh, priority for me. So I'll be trying to cull those students out of the woodwork. And part of that is because I'm bringing in such a great series of speakers, and I want, I want that audience for those, um, those scholars. The first speaker that I'll be bringing in for the launch of the Liberty and Ethics Center is named David Beto. And uh, Dr. Beto is actually a, uh, a history professor at the University of Alabama, but he's also the chair of the Committee for Civil Rights in the state of Alabama. And so he's done great work, for instance, on the negative impact of eminent, the use of eminent domain on the impoverished and particularly on the African-American community. Um, so I think that's really interesting. The reason I'm aware of him is because he wrote a book that I used in my own research called The Voluntary City. It's a fascinating book in which he collects essays by a number of different people 
giving examples of you know mutual aid societies, just amazing ways in which private people can uh, come together as a group in order to address a problem that seems like it's impossible. Now this is actually something like we were talking about in the last segment is that there's been some changes in how this has been addressed over time and I believe right. Beto has talked about how these problems were addressed, it used to be addressed in, right. in the South and now maybe the attitude or how they're handled now is different and maybe less effectively, is that Well, correct? and mutual aid societies are a great example of this. These were very popular for whites and blacks, but especially among the black community. Mutual aid societies uh, you could be a part of, it's not like an insurance company where they're gonna pull your risk and give you a higher rate if you're riskier. You, would, you were just a member. And oftentimes they would cover what we would now consider sort of the things that are covered by insurance. And so you would cover the costs of a funeral if the husband died, you would cover if someone was sick and couldn't work, um, taking care of the widow after the death of a husband and things like that. And of course, that's exactly why Social Security was created to do that sort of thing. So we see a kind of replacement effect right. where you have the state trying to address these things and then that sort of takes away the purpose or the meaning of the societies. And then once the societies are lost, then you lose an important piece of cultural capital. Um, you know, that, that those societies would have also been a place where entrepreneurs could meet people who could give them loans and things like that. But now they're, now they're not there as much anymore. So it's, it's a great loss. Yeah. yeah, well, I, as an economist, I approach it as a, it's a loss of effectiveness and efficiency mm -hmm. of actually mm -hmm. uh, addressing needs. But it's, uh, I think this actually points out the different parts of the Hammond Institute is yeah. your angle, additional angle to that is it's, it, it's just the purpose is gone and just yeah. the, well, and the, it's culturally and morally a right. great loss because right. that's that's a piece of particularly in the African American society, which is a vulnerable group in the first place. And I'm thinking here of the 20s and 30s um, to have that sort of social infrastructure where you have certain organizations that you're a member of, and that's how you know one another, and that's how you network. Um, you know, we take those sorts of things for granted, I think, um, and then you don't you don't know what you're missing till it's gone. Now, Beto's most recent book is actually on T. R. M. Howard. Howard was, and I'm, I'm in the middle of it now, and it, it is a page turner. I mean, I can't, I can't stop. It is so interesting. Um, he was a hugely successful businessman, actually a doctor, a medical doctor, which of course was very rare in those days, but he had a, a white mentor and, uh, and was able to become a doctor, was able to uh, finally break out into business and make a lot of money and was able to then use that to jump into civil rights and is really an important figure in the history of civil rights, but one that we don't talk about as much because he doesn't fit our picture of what a civil rights figure it looks like. Mm -hmm. He's a businessman, more on the Booker T. Washington approach than the, than the W.E.B. Du Bois approach. In other words, you know, Washington's approach was that we should take advantage of our connections with the white community and work at gaining skills and gaining an entree into the business community and integrating in a kind of organic way, uh, where Dubois was, was emphasizing more sort of the demand for political rights. And so we definitely, when we think of civil rights, we always think of um, the movement for specific laws as opposed to, uh, and of course he did some of that. I mean, Howard did that, and of course Jim Crow did need to be overturned. On the other hand, you have that element of, of black entrepreneurship, community building, you know, that is so much more to me the, the strength behind the civil rights movement. Right. Now, you, when is the date of your launch? Uh, my launch is going to be on October 24th. And so he'll be coming to speak in the afternoon. We'll be nailing down details as we come. And that's open to the public. And open to the public, and yes. And great. should be especially interesting to the, to the history students, of course, and the political science students. So um, yeah, I'm hoping to get a good crowd out to that. Okay, now your other speakers are uh, very different from Beto. Yes. Uh, can you tell us about one of those? Yeah, I, I have, uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to do a speaker series in our initial launch um, for this year was to sort of set a tone to bring in the different interests of the Liberty and Ethics Center. So you have Beto with the emphasis on voluntary association and the importance of that and Howard's role in um, in that in, in Mississippi, you know, way back in the day. But then uh, I'm bringing in Tom Woods in November, and Tom Woods is actually fairly well known now. He wrote The, the Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. Right. Uh, he wrote um, How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization and, uh, and so forth. So his, his name is out there uh, quite a bit. And the reason I'm bringing Woods in is because I think sometimes we take for granted 
what a cultural achievement it is to have the institutions that we have that even allow us to move forward in our, in our markets, right? We have private property, voluntary exchange, peaceful exchange of government, you know, and so forth. And, um, you know, when you look at the global situation, you see just how tenuous those sorts of things can be. In some cases, you have very weak property rights. You have um, very unstable governments, situations where things are run by warlords. And when we in the university sit and discuss, you know, how we feel about capitalism, we often don't think we, we, about... We, we take all of the benefits of it for granted and yeah. don't really attach it to where it came from. Right. And so, and so that can affect, I think, quite negatively our, our um, foreign policy where we're not appreciating enough that we just need some economic stability here to get things moving. And economic stability often, of course, requires political stability as well. So, um, so Woods, in his sort of analysis of, of our history, right, through you know, the history of Western civilization, really appreciates everything that went into having the institutions that we do have now that allows us to have such a peaceful Now, as just society. as a preview, what sort of institutions do you think is most important? I and mean, does he mean the political institutions, the civil institutions, just the... Yeah, clearly the civil institutions are the ones that he's valuing right. the most. Um, so in the medieval period, you had a really interesting situation where the, the church and the state both sort of wanted power, and that worked out because they both limited one another in their vying for, for power. Well, and this it is what up, it's the competition. The competition, right. And so it ended up creating a space for individuals, and we, I mean, perhaps somewhat by accident. But you also have cultural um, capital coming in from really the Christian tradition. So you have Augustine, St. Augustine, who's emphasizing the notion of, you know, the self, the individual, the individual will, the one that makes a choice, you know, for God or against. Um, you know, you, you may not know this, Augustine is actually the first person to write an autobiography. I don't think it ever occurred to anyone to write an autobiography before. The first narcissist. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and he wrote The Confessions, which is, of course, the most famous autobiography. And so that notion of the individual self, the chooser, kind of comes in at that point. And so the, the, the um, coalescence of that idea and then with the competition that opens up space for the individual, you see very slowly over time the development of freedom, really, the birth of freedom in the West. And um, it's, it's an amazing mixture of, of good ideas and perhaps historical accident. To some, to some now, extent. Woods is, I, I guess some people would find him controversial. I mean, I know the word controversial is thrown around to say no, some, he's someone, controversial. I, someone I disagree with. But <laughs> yeah. <it's>, it's <laughs> no, he's definitely controversial. Um, and part of it is that, you know, he is willing to be politically incorrect. He's willing mm -hmm. to come right out and, and say things. And, and I have to say I appreciate it to a great extent. Um, I think, for instance, that, you know, because we have bad policies that are put into place by people with good intentions, um, it's easy to keep on excusing ourselves for our bad policies. And I do agree with him that at some point you have to stop and say, we need to take responsibility for the mess we've created and how badly it's affected other people's lives. And so I, I agree with him to sort of push the envelope mm -hmm. a little bit with that kind of language. Um, and there are other elements of his thought, you know, there, there are ways that he looks at history that, you know, it's not the, the popular way at the moment. Um, now, are there any other of your speakers who might be viewed as controversial? Yes, yes, there are. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the final speaker. So are you ramping up the controversy as you go along? I don't know. Who's more, who's worse, Woods or Higgs? <laughs> I don't know. But um, so in the spring, I want to do our annual spring political philosophy conference. And um, this year, we're going to be dealing with the way in which uh, the way in which p political policies can actually warp markets or sometimes try to get markets moving faster than they really naturally or organically would. And then we have fallout from that that then gets blamed on markets. And so there's a lot of things we complain about, your suburban sprawl. You can think of different things that people associate with markets. But when you actually look at the details, you see that you have the state pushing something uh, that's not necessarily natural to the markets themselves. So that's the theme of that conference. The keynote speaker for that conference will be Robert Higgs. And um, Higgs is well known. He, uh, he wrote a book called Crisis and Leviathan. If you know Thomas Hobbes' book, Leviathan, mm -hmm. which, is on, which is on the state, um, Hobbes calls the state the artificial man, and he makes an argument for its, its necessity. And, um, and Higgs' argument is about the, what he calls the ratchet effect. 
So the ratchet effect is the notion that the state, the incentive structures within the government are really for the government to grow. There's not, it's not like a business where you see, you have a bottom line and you say, oh, we can't afford that, right? We have to stop, we have to cover our costs. You don't really have a bottom line because you're taxing, right? It's, it's, uh, well, your you're, bottom line is how big you are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so what you end up getting is sort of excuses to get bigger. So, so crisis in Leviathan is let's create a crisis. We'll get a little bigger in order to address the crisis. And then we're not going to ratchet back. We're going to ratchet up, right? And so sometimes the crisis might be real and we might need to give up a certain civil liberty or something or give up taxes in order to address it, but then we don't go back and repeal it after the fact. Sometimes it's actually sort of trumped up. Um, and so we, we use a lot of language, you know, the, the war on poverty, the war on drugs, you know, the war on obesity, the, and it just goes on and on. We've got to fight all these wars. And so everyone feels like we better mobilize. And when we're in that mindset, we're ready to give up more than we normally are. And so it ratchets its way up. So he'll be talking about that. And the other reason that Higgs is a little controversial, even for conservatives. It didn't sound controversial, but I knew there'd be something. Yes, even for conservatives, <laughs> is because um, he really is very anti-war. And so for Higgs, he wants to apply the same distrust of the state that we have with regard to free markets to, to uh, the military industrial complex as well. Or actually the original term from Eisenhower was the military congressional industrial, industrial. complex, right? And so um, I really appreciate that point of his. Why are we so trusting in this one area when we're ready to be, have a lot of distrust in another area? Um, so all of a sudden where, you know, we feel like, oh yes, you know, I'm pro, I'm pro state and pro big government when it comes to defense. Um, and so he's, yeah, he's much more critical in that regard. So I'm hoping to get a lot of good, good uh, arguments stirred up there that day. And, um, and we're not just going to let the conservatives sit still. They're going to have to, have to well, argue Well, it's a too. different type of argument. One of the, uh, you know, we had our first, one of our events a couple of years ago, we had for the institute. Uh, my own institute was, uh, we had protesters, the first protesters with placards. Oh yes, I was campus. there, yes. Uh -huh. And uh, we're looking forward to that, but I wonder <laughs> if the types of speakers you're bringing in are gonna deliver placards. It seems that the, uh, the groups that protest and occupy are not the ones you'll be offending. Will you be? <laughs> That's a great question, because of course in that case you had a particular group that felt attacked. I, I remember that that it was uh, teachers. had to do with education, yeah. in particular education policy. So there was a certain policy that was going to be passed. And of course these speakers, my speakers, are talking on bigger ideas. So the question is, will there be one group that feels sort of victimized enough to come and show up and say anything? Uh, but I don't know. It's, it's possible. Well, I think one of our goals might be to stir up the faculty to protest. Yeah, the other maybe faculty. so. <laughs> well, we're, we've run out of time. So thank you, Rachel, for being with us today. You're welcome. Uh, this has been Free Exchange. I hope you discussed or I hope you enjoyed our discussion today. And if you did, check out the Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise at www.lindenwood.edu slash Hammond Institute, all one word, and thank you.